So I'm all, I'm never always certain how to start an episode, <laughs> um, which I think is the eternal problem facing many of our associated podcasts. <laughs> many I of think our the uh, people. Yeah, I think the standard is to cold open and then um, randomly just say yes and welcome and then introduce everybody. <laughs> all right, so somebody come up with some bullshit. Um, the new It movie looks pretty bullshit. Ah, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> I can't say that because I haven't seen it yet, and I really want to, just so I can satisfy my curiosity. Well, I'm kind of surprised, uh, I'm kind of not surprised Tim Curry wasn't redoing his role, because he's an old dinosaur. <laughs> oh, God. Ah, I'm gonna, cold open! I'm going to ignore that. I'm, I'm, we're going to hang up now and <laughs> start this all over again. <laughs> Uh, I I have seen it, and uh, the horror, or lack thereof, yeah, is just so try hard. It's so try. It's it's just so trying to be edgy, and, and it's like that's not the fucking point. Well, from from what I hear, like the kids are great, the story and the movies <laughs> crafted pretty well, yeah, and it's fun and that's all cool. But like as a horror movie, it's Scary clowns and jump scares and yeah, yeah, no, like people are yeah, I don't know. No, no, it, no, you're right. It's yeah, like I said on Twitter, it it works as like a sort of like a good versus evil story. I think it actually works very well. I like the way the kids are written. You know, as many people have noted, it's it's pretty nice to hear kids say fuck in a movie. Yeah, um, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and um, and yeah, it works on that level. But in terms of an understanding of horror, it just, it just really fails. Well, I think it's banking on... <clears throat> I t- it, I t- yeah, it's banking on, oh, uh, it, the clown was scary 30 years ago, Which, so therefore it will be again, and we can get away with it because well, we're a remake. That. I think that that was a mis- I mean, like, overall, I think it's a terrible mistake on their port- part, because visually, what made the clown scary is not what they the direction they decided to go in they decided to go edgy and dark and give yeah, yeah. a creepy clown even more creepy clown face which is something that generally you don't have to do no yeah it's it's the context of like there's a clown like in a place where a clown shouldn't be in fact be. the cuter and sweeter the clown looks the more creepy it is yeah i think it was um slime piece actually i think said this on twitter or somewhere but he said saying, it on discord yeah, yeah, um, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. What made Pennywise scary, to him at least, was that it was an adult who you know was doing wrong things, but you can't rat them out. And that's a very scary thing to a child because, you know, a child may not be believed or something by other adults. And so there's, you know, what do you do from an, an, an authority figure that you can't get away from? And from the trailers, which, again... It's, that's all I have to go off of. It looks very much, oh, creepy clown doing creepy clown things, and yep. kind of missing the point. Absolutely, yeah. No, I totally agree. It's Well, now that we've stolen the witching hours next episode, I'm guessing. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, but bears won't have any dinosaurs in it, so. This is true. Take that, witching hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we love them. We love them all. Um, we do. All right, so, hello, everybody. <sighs> Uh, my name is Prasikor, and I am uh, six foot thirteen, and I'm joined <laughs> here. <laughs> and you're general here. Six thirteen, so seven what? Um, no, it's because it's metric. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so like, oh, no. so like over twenty feet tall. Um. <laughs> And I am joined by our two lovely spacefaring uh, individuals. Would you care to introduce we yourself managed. to the nice people? <laughs> Greetings, it is us, Abysme and Paprika from Ray Gun Readers. And we've managed to uh, bend subspace to make this call so that we could get past the time lag. So you just, you just like, confirmed subspace as part of our canon no, now? No, I meant the thing. The, no, the, no, the you said that. Uh, oh, great, now the, space time. now the thing is also part of your canon. Yeah, yeah, look what you just did. Look what you just opened, this horrible can I, of I, subspace worms. I hope I opened a can of this thing. Subspace, space time? Yes, yes. 
Anyway, yes, uh, we are Ray Gun Readers. We have a science fiction podcast. So here and, we are. Uh, you are what, 5'7? And I'm 5'2? Five 5'7? Five I'm 5'10. Five Whatever. 5'7. <laughs> I'll insult He's me. He's 5'13. <laughs> uh, do you mean his height or his age? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, did you meet Lovecraft? Uh, no, because I'm not from Earth, so how would I do that? Well, that doesn't give me a gauge on your age, though. Uh, if you don't just ask somebody their age, that's very rude. Uh, Bismi, how old are you? I'm um, about 513. <laughs> <laughs> he still hasn't told me, and we've been cruising around in this ship for 20 years. Well, if he hasn't, mm-hmm. well, if he hasn't figured it out by now. Yeah. Is, is yeah. he like Tommy Wiseau, or it's just, there's no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no indication <laughs> as to his origin? Nope. No. no, well, I mean, it's a very secretive species. Try looking it up. You won't find it. Details will be revealed over time the more I begin to trust you. And you're on pretty thin ice. 20 years. Yeah, thin ice. Uh, anyway, I'd what are we talking not, about today? To it's now my head. <laughs> It's now my headcanon that um, Abysme is the same species as Tommy Wiseau, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> I've often said oh, that, that Tommy Wiseau is an alien who is tr- who is studying humans and trying to be one of us. And he he would get a like a passing grade in his alien class. Yeah, like, he'd get like a C plus in his class, but he, he fails utterly in the field. Yes. Who's Tommy Wiseau? He's from The Room. The oh, that guy! Yeah, the creator yeah. of The Room. Yeah. I think um, I, I can totally see that, because just the way he talks and walks and comports himself is yes. very strange. Yep. No one else is Tommy Wiseau. He's like, he's like the alien from Men in Black, walking around. One of the many that's like, clearly, you know, there's something very off about them, but you don't want to say anything. Yeah. yeah but like, yeah. MIB knows they're aliens, yeah. But, Tom, yes, oh, man. Tommy Wiseau gives um, more credibility to the Men in Black movies than anything. Why <laughs> wasn't he in the Men in Black movies? That would have been amazing. Yeah, all those all those people this on the screen that are like, oh, that celebrity's an alien, and that celebrity's an alien. Yeah. Why not put the one who actually probably is? <laughs> That'd be the best cameo. Yeah. Oh, well. Series no, is done. No, he's, he's too busy making... Um, are you kidding me? Of course they're going to make another Men in Black. Oh, they made four? money off of it. Did they make money yes. off of three? Oh, great. Yeah, they made, I think they, sure. made, they made more money off three than uh, two, at least. Uh, really? Well, oh, two, yeah. two, two was all right. Number one's the classic in my book. That movie's really fun. But three, for about half a second, had dinosaurs in it. This is true. Just like half today's half. episode... So oh, I hear we're talking about this this Earth concept of, of dinosaurs. Dino sours. <laughs> it's not a concept. They were a thing. <laughs> I don't Something know. Something that your what you? seems to think exists. You you guys claim a lot existing. of things are things, and there's a lot of you know disagreement over it. But Abysme so. was actually there. Hey. Were there dinosaurs in Bismi? Uh They were, and um, they're actually hyper-intelligent species who just forgot to kind of clean up their graveyards when they left Earth. So you guys are kind of working off a lot of misinformation, <laughs> I feel. But, you know, you're in the right direction. No. I've dinosaurs. seen your Jurassic Park, and it's it's getting close. Oh, dear God. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. If dinosaurs were super... In- that we know that dinosaurs are not super intelligent. You want to know why? Because the dino- dinosaur fossil record makes sense. <laughs> I've been I've been thinking about okay, what happens if like in you know hundreds of millions of years in the future, some other sapient species comes along, whether from this planet or not, and mm-hmm. they're studying the fossil record of Earth, you know, throughout the Phanerozoic, and everything's going fine until they reach the you know this point, and suddenly everything stops making sense. Yeah. Suddenly there are animals where there shouldn't be. There's this one that's living on pretty much every continent, despite not having any general adaptations for diverse living. True. Um, yeah. It's we are gonna totally fuck with uh, future paleontologists. <clears throat> Did you ever play uh, the Mass Effect series? I have not. No. Are there uh, dinosaurs in that? 
<laughs> they look like them, but yeah. no. Uh, th- there's one of the main characters is a basically a paleontologist and just goes to different planets and does it and like gets in trouble because haha. But I, I imagine if like humans weren't um, in that like as a primary species and that character came to Earth and looked at like post apocalyptic Earth, that's the exact reaction she would have. Yeah. Of just wait, how come? What are cats? Why are they everywhere? (laughs) This doesn't make any sense. Where do they evolve from? You're gonna. Well, I mean, what? Since for the past two thousand years, five thousand years, we've been destroying history as quickly as we've been making it. Mm, Yeah, a lot of it. We know less about what happened five thousand years ago than we do about what happened twenty billion years ago. Yeah. Interestingly. Yeah. Twenty billion years ago, there was no universe. So yeah. you're right. A million. Oh, I said, said billion. million. You said billion. I, I heard it. I said million. Whatever. <laughs> well, let rewind let, it. Let Keep press the core. Rewind let, it and see if she said billion. Let us know in the comments. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> the eternal struggle continues. The Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Is, is correct. that correct? 4.5. Yeah. 4.5. 4.6. Okay. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Hmm. And, so uh, some level of accuracy, give or take. Give or take an A hundred million years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Um, but you know, it's interesting. You know, because um, this actually is is a nice little lead into our uh, discussion today, which is dinosaurs in science fiction, and mm. that's one interesting avenue that dinosaurs will sometimes take in science fiction is the speculative uh, intelligent dinosaurs. Uh, mm-hmm. Which there has been a lot of talk about them. Probably the most famous one, and one of the more, well, probably one of the first um, uh, speculations on the subject was, uh, is it Dale Russell, I think, who commissioned uh, the dinosauroid model uh, <laughs> in his publication of uh, what was until a few weeks ago Troodon Formosus, but I think that name has been largely thrown out in favor of being split up. But anyway, um, mm. this. Uh, Medi- this smallish, about person-sized um, theropod dinosaur, so like a two-legged, a, a raptor-type-ish thing. Sure. Um, and they decided to do a little thought experiment of what would happen if... Because um, Troodon is well-known for being one of the most intelligent of the non-bird dinosaurs. Now, intelligent for a non-bird dinosaur still means about on the same level of, like, a possum or an ostrich, so <laughs> not not that smart. But uh, what if, given another 66 million years of evolution, what, you know, if they were to evolve into yeah. intelligent life forms, what might they look like? And their answer so was... So that would have been that would have been their best bet for intelligent life right there? For Yes. Um, and their also-imaginative minds came up with a lizard person, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> um, they had all of these. I mean, you can look. Sci-fi. You can look this up um, on Google. I might put the image in the um, in the YouTube version. Um, but it is this, you know, this very famous model of this. It's essentially a lizard person, and they had all this sort of so-called reasoning behind it. Um, that basically uh, the the pressures that forced us into our body type would also be acting on the troodon. So basically, through convergence, because they evolved human-like intelligence, they evolved a human-like body. <coughs> Um, this has been criticized widely by many or, paleontologists. Yeah, uh, or an inability to think outside the box on, um, yeah. you know, it's, that kind of life. Yeah, it's, it's as unlikely as it is unimaginative. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, that's very interesting because I uh, we read a lot of classic sci-fi books and we are pretty big fans of the cover art. And many, many a time... Will the cover art or the inside art be of a lizard person? It is it's a, a pretty common image. It's a very like I don't know the subconscious human fascination with lizards being uh, anthropomorphized into you know ape like humanoid upright all that. It's uh, that's a very common thing. I have to wonder why. It is interesting, and I'd also like to know how far back in time it goes. Uh, yeah, because we have we have tales of ape men. Going back, you know, thousands of years, mm-hmm. but it would be interesting mm-hmm. to know how far back the lizard men go. And I'm sure, no. Well, I'm sure it goes all the way back because people have been di- finding dinosaur bones since forever. So. Well, and the Egyptians, I mean, they made everything walk upright. In so fact, lizards, crocodile crocodiles. Guy. Yeah, Sebek is very much. It looks like a lizard man. He's a lizard person, <laughs> even though he's a crocodile. So there you go. So, yeah, I mean, there's just that one point I do want to bring out. Yeah, people have been finding um, 
fossilized remains for thousands of years and probably interpreting them in all kinds of crazy ways. But it's probably, like a lot, some people kind of take that idea a little too far, like saying there's this one, um, uh, oh, what is her, what is her field exactly? I don't want to get it wrong. So I'll just say there's this one doctor, um, named Adrian Mayer who makes the claim that like, uh, the griffin is inspired by, uh, fossils of protoceratops found in Mongolia. And mm. it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, it does. Well, I mean, that's the kind of thing I would put, like, uh, animals like dragons, for instance, probably came from dinosaurs. Yeah, uh, uh, they did find something in what, I think maybe Mongolia or Central Asia, that some people speculate, oh, this is where the idea of the kind of eastern dragon came from, because they thought it had, like, a... A, a, like a special thing in its skull or something. I forget what it, like the exact uh, fossil was. It's it's not quite that. It's it's not so much that I, I don't personally believe that the, the fossil bones inspired myths. I think the myths already existed and fossils reinforced them. Um, mm. there, them. There are very, very few direct instances where we can say, oh, the discovery of this fossil is linked to this belief. There's only one I can think of off the top of my head. And that was the discovery of a rhinoceros skull um, somewhere in Europe. And mm, it, yeah. it's actually in a church. And it was claimed oh. to be the skull of a dragon, of a lindworm. Oh. Uh, okay, yeah, that sounds more familiar. Yeah, but in, in the East, fossils have been, you know, people have been collecting fossils and grinding them up into powder. Oh, oh yes. gosh. <laughs> For a very, very oh, long time. no. Yeah, good, uh, goodness knows how many fossils we've lost to uh, uh, traditional Eastern medicine practices. Uh, that is uh, that that is always a shame. To go back to those um, sci-fi books we read, it wasn't too long ago we were shopping around in, like, second-hand bookstores for these things, because until we found out that they're all being uploaded to the Internet, thankfully, um, it's really hard to find them. And then we went to one store, and they said, oh, we used to have a bunch of them, but uh, no one wanted them, so we just ended up like recycling them and like turning them into paper mush, and we like we both died a little bit on the inside uh, <laughs> when that happens. Like, oh, dude, you got to preserve those somehow, please. I I, I get that there's not a, a whole lot of um, interest in those books, but I don't know. Lately, we've developed an affinity for them. So. And that I mean that goes for so many things. Uh, the amount of like historical buildings that have been. And not like, I'm not even saying recently, but in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance where they built on top of ancient ruins or just knocked them over to build something else. Uh, like, we'll never know what mm -hmm. those were. They are gone forever. There's just no way of knowing. But my more important question for me, if dinosaurs were intelligent and they did make up you know, civilization fabrics and stuff... <laughs> That stuff would all be gone. It's Civilizations, years. fabrics, the most important part of civilization. <laughs> Whatever. Textiles. <laughs> well, but if they had a Bronze Age, for instance, I don't know. <laughs> well, most yeah, most things they made would be gone. Um, right. Ironically, yeah. depending on how far their civilization went, if they did leave anything behind, let's say that they were to make it to the moon, that's probably their best bet at leaving any trace of, of what they leave uh -huh. behind. But like I said... If intelligent dinosaurs were around, there would be signs in the fossil record. Like, things would stop making sense. We would have this nice, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, sensible progression of, um, you know, evolution until, like, we, we suddenly hit their industrial revolution, and then suddenly things go crazy. Like, why is, the, why is this one large herbivore everywhere? <laughs> it's like, well, because they were, they were farming them for, you know, for their meat, yeah. you know, you know things like that. Yeah. Um, and also, we haven't found any fossils of any uh, animals with a, with a brain endo, you know, endo. Uh, God, what's the word? Like the the shape of the brain inside the skull. Right. Enough, uh, yeah. enough room for the the brain to grow. So what you're saying is, size. if we go to your moon, we'll find ancient dino bones where they clearly <sighs> went to true. the moon. That's true. There have been no excavations on the moon. They yeah. haven't. The possibility is still there. <laughs> um, well, maybe not, maybe not like fossils, but like, like if they left something like, um, a Voyager spacecraft mm. or something, you know, um, like an Apollo something, you know, maybe, but I don't think it's very likely. Um, yeah, I mean, but it'll be much more well preserved on the moon than here. Yeah, true.
True that. Right. That that's what I mean. It is the best chance is is if it's on the moon because there's not there's you no know, weather. Uh, there's no microbes. There's you know nothing really to worry about destroying it. Except, Except for, for Neil Armstrong. <laughs> just going around kicking everything. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I wanna I want there to be a new conspiracy theorist group where um that's all about excavating uh dinosaur bones it's, on the moon. It's not that we faked the moon landing, it's that we went up and we found dinosaurs and we're not telling anybody about it. Right. That's that's just, that is one. that is exactly what the internet needs, a new conspiracy oh theory. My God. <laughs> if, if if it will deflect attention away from the flat earthers, I'm happy with that. <laughs> that's a good point. That's, that is a good point. Yeah. Um, Give them something else to That's a pretty over. fun one though. Flat Earth? No, that's a pretty fun conspiracy theory. Moon, yeah, moon dinosaurs. It is. Moon, moon dinosaurs, dinosaurs is my new favorite conspiracy theory. Moonosaurs. Or even Martian dinosaurs. We haven't any excavations on Mars either. Yeah, we have. Just hasn't been very deep. Not deep enough. Yeah, it's in the same way that a five-year-old excavates a beach when it <laughs> makes a sandcastle, yeah. <laughs> don't don't crush five year old astro- uh, astronaut dreams of one day digging on the moon. I will go. Mars. Are you kidding? I'll go over and kick their sandcastles down myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. You heard it here, folks. I'm just a giant jerk. <laughs> <laughs> that poor Mars rover made a sandcastle, and Prascor wants to destroy it. Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna steal its girlfriend. Ah. <laughs> 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 uh. Oh, man. <laughs> but it's funny that people spend all this time speculating on what intelligent dinosaurs might look like, because in reality, we already have intelligent dinosaurs. They they have evolved, and they are with us today. Things like crows and ravens uh, and parrots. Crows are pretty smart. Yeah, um, it's just they're not ginormous and can destroy things, so people overlook that, which is unfortunate mm-hmm. but true. Tell that to uh, Tippy Hedren. Um, <laughs> but no, um, so all this stuff about, like, dinosaurs would evolve a human-like body plan. It's like, no, they would not. Uh, even if you exposed a dinosaur to the exact same uh, environmental conditions and the exact same uh, pressures that humans faced in our evolution, they wouldn't. And we know this for a fact because uh, that did happen. Um, there is a group of birds today called ground hornbills that basically went through all the stages that... Um, uh, humans went through in terms of the selective pressures acting upon them. And lo and behold, they did not evolve into humanoids. <laughs> I mean, there's no reason to think that our body plan is uniquely special um, for this purpose. Uh, we see intelligence or near intelligence in a lot of animals on Earth that are very, very much not like us. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about apes because they, they're, our intelligence and their intelligence is basically the same, and it's the same line. Well, yeah. It's, yeah, it's the same family tree. Yeah. 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 But we see it so, independently evolving in toothed whales, in um, elephants, in uh, crows and ravens. Uh, so it's it's popping up in many different places, and you don't need to look like a person to have you know, mm-hmm. human levels of intelligence. Well. So why, and this is going to go back to biology 101, but uh, why why us and not other species? Was it just happenstance? Was it... Some special arrangement of circumstances? Um, per- or do we not know? Well, we never know. Um, whenever we're talking <laughs> about uh, the past and, and prehistory, we never know. It's uh, That's the thing you got to be able to live with in uh, paleontology. But, yeah. um, again, it's just the, the certain uh, pressures that were acting upon us. Uh, Maybe we had to be smart enough to uh, survive the Ice Age or something. Yeah, but like so, so many other species. Well, I, I watched a documentary once that also said that um, uh, when we added protein to our more protein to our diet, it allowed our brains to get bigger or something like that. that. that yeah, that's a that's a, a, a popular um, hypothesis for uh, what drove the increase of human intelligence, and it's true. You do need mm-hmm. you do need more. Uh, protein to fuel brains that are good for things like tool making and such. Uh, that's why mm-hmm. the smartest apes today all in, have some level of uh, meat in their diet. Uh, the smartest mm-hmm. are like chimps, and they're the most carnivorous of all the apes. And take that, vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm kidding. Proof I'm positive, kidding. non-meat eaters are <laughs> stupid. <laughs> but it also, it's a cyclical thing because... Um, if you need protein, if you need meat, uh, they cannot rely on things like scavenging, uh, because, mm-hmm. uh, there are very, very few 
animals who rely on scavenging. Pretty much vultures are the only ones who rely on scavenging. And that's because vultures like can... Like exclusively? Yeah. And because vultures can soar for hundreds of miles while expending very little energy. So they can, you know, find uh, enough food in enough time. But an ape can't do that. So that True. means there's a pressure to become more actively predacious. And pr uh, predation requires intelligence. You need uh, a brain to... It, it takes a lot more brain power to stalk and hunt than it does to walk around and eat grass. Sure, um, definitely. Uh, Can you define uh, predacious? One that pred uh, is a predator. Oh, predator. Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. One that preys it's, it's the adjective form of predator. Um, yeah. Now, having said that, those were the pressures that resulted in the evolution of our intelligence. That you know, but there could are probably other avenues. I mean, elephants, for example, are not carnivorous at all, um, except for a few freak incidents. But um, <laughs> they're pretty they, smart. They are very, very smart. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose it depends on the the what your body chemistry and that you know the evolutionary conditions for even protein to make that much of a difference. Sure. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, there have been a few, you know, other imaginings of what intelligent dinosaurs might look like, intelligent non-bird dinosaurs, or even highly evolved parrots and crows, and, and you can find artwork out there online. Um, I'll, I'll try to link to, there's one artist in particular I know who does a fantastic job with these, I'm just not sure where to find him now, he's, um, oh, no. and that is, um, uh, Shevdet, uh, um, no, sorry, no, Mehmet Shevdet Kozman, CM Kozman, um, formerly known as Nemo Ramjet. Uh, I'll try to link to some of his um, reconstructions, or not reconstructions, but constructions of uh, intelligent dinosaurs. And he's gone really crazy with it. Uh, he's not only done, um, you know, intelligent bird-like dinosaurs, uh, but also like intelligent brontosaurs that he called uh, brontosapiens, <laughs> uh, which were pretty cool, and um, things like that. So, What if there was uh, evolutionary... Uh, intelligent dinosaurs, but they uh, have evolved away from a bone mass that would survive uh, 50 million years. Um, here's the thing. Before, here, well, first of all, you'd be surprised um, the bone mass that will uh, preserve. Remember, there are, I mean, feathers will preserve and they have, like, no mass. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, that, like, uh, pterosaurs, the flying reptiles of the Mesozoic era, have extremely thin uh, bone walls just a few centimeters thick. Uh, they preserve not well, but they you know we don't have a lot of them, but they do preserve. Um, and even then, even if you you um, you d they did were to reach a that yeah, that was clunky. Um, even if they were to reach that point, um, there would have to be something before that. And mm -hmm. um, odds are they would there would be indications of of some kind of higher intelligence even before uh, that. Uh, a transparent. Dinosaur uh, fossil. Transparent. <laughs> Translucent. Oh, God, this is turning into um, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, <laughs> no, let's not revisit that video. Well, have fun. I think I found uh, Mr. Ramjet on uh, DeviantArt. Yeah, he hasn't, up he hasn't updated that in uh, years. So but um, his, but the some one of his thing... stuff is there. It's cool, though. I yeah. like it. Um, the one thing I'd say it would be necessary for um, an intelligent, well, not necessary, necessary is the wrong word. One thing I would sort of expect to see with an intelligent species is the ability to manipulate things finely. Yes. And so that, mm -hmm. that limits, you know, the beak, for instance, or, um, you know, just teeth. <laughs> well, there, it, you know, it's easy for... This is the same reason that people make jokes about T-Rex having short arms. Mm -hmm. um, for us, arms and hands are very important um, for manipulating things. and you know, We can't imagine life without them. Uh, but there are other ways of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen the way parrots uh, um, grab things and hold things with their feet, um, you know, to us, of course, it, it looks very awkward, and it probably is a little awkward to some degree, but they are capable of doing things. Um, mm -hmm. but, but you're absolutely right. Um, you do need some way to manipulate your environment. In fact, speaking of Nemo Ramjet, um, one of the things he's most well known for is this um, online uh, book you can find called uh, All Tomorrows, um, A Billionaire Chronicle of the Myriad uh, Forms and Mixed Fortunes of Man, which is all about... Um, the future history of the human race, and all the many things that happen to us in the uh, coming billions of years, 
Uh, one thing that happens is that we basically get twist, we get invaded by one alien species that twists and genetically warps us into a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes. Um, one of them is called the mantelopes, uh, which are basically uh, human beings uh, genetically modified into like uh, hoofed mammals. And hmm. one th one thing that basically happens is that one day the aliens just leave because that's what they do. They're nomadic. They never stay in one place for too long. So these um, human hoofed mammals are just left on their own. Now they're still fairly intelligent. The problem is they have no way to manipulate their environment because you know they, they only have hooves. Yeah. <laughs> so what eventually happens is that they lose their intelligence because, as it says in the pros, a, a, you know a dumb mantelope can graze just as effectively as a smart one and uses less energy. That sounds fascinating. That's an interesting idea. So yeah. you have to keep your mind active somehow. Oh yeah. It's almost like a It's a muscle. Don't don't exercise it. Unstable it equilibrium there. Flaps. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. yeah, I mean that's this it's another great example of how, you know, yeah, evolution is all about you know what what's what works in a particular mm -hmm. environment. And you know, we think of intelligence as you know, the key to our success, and it is, um, but only in this you know, given our particular circumstances. There are circum there are circumstances for other animals and in other environments where it would not be beneficial. It would be a cost, so sure. it would be lost. Hmm. Man, that is so fascinating to think about. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll try to find a, a link to uh, all tomorrows and put it in the description. Yeah, I would be interested to read that. Is it like a visual novel, or is it mostly just? Text. It's 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 a it's basically like um it's mostly paintings with um like a paragraph or two of text to accompany it. Mm. Excellent. I like yeah. that. Yep, yeah, it's very much inspired by another a uh, book called uh, Man After Man, uh, which is written by Dougal Dixon, who, who is well known as sort of like the father of speculative evolution. And uh, also has weird, crazy shit about, you know, self-imposed genetic manipulation, um, aliens, crazy shit. You know, it's it, it's really out there. It's really sci-fi. Mm. Is he the guy who came up with the concept of the greys? No. No, greys were no. around before him. Yeah. Okay. Because I remember that one. I, I forget who came up with it, but it was this just very kind of obscure concept of, well, if there was a space-faring race that was humanoid, they would be in zero-G, so they would have kind of diminutive bodies, their eyes would adjust to mostly darkness, hence why they're black, um, their brains, you know, intelligence would be a lot more important than moving heavy machinery, so that's why you get this weird little gray creature. Um, mm -hmm. I, need to, I need to track down who came up with that, but that's another interesting speculative idea. Um, so that's so that pretty much that covers one uh, pretty big thing with dinosaurs and science fiction is intelligent dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, now, usually, when it comes to dinosaurs and science fiction, there are about four or five different ways that we get them. Uh, one, we have the uh, the lost world scenario where we have a relictual population of non-bird dinosaurs that are surviving in some disparate corner of the planet. Um, some t now, depending on how much the author cares about such things, uh, these were uh, these will either be uh, just identical species that we know, so you'll see a T. Rex and a Triceratops and a Brontosaurus, etc., uh, or they will have gone the extra mile and try to think of what ways in which dinosaurs might evolve given another sixty-six million years of evolution, and you'll see these you know, speculative fictional dinosaurs. Um, yeah. Apart from that, there's uh, time travel, of course, <laughs> where you know either um, everyone's favorite. Everyone's favorite. Either and you know. I'm reminded of the the cartoon. It was actually one of my favorites when I was younger. We're back. I was uh, hoping you weren't going to bring that one up. Oh, dear fucking god! <laughs> dear fucking god! We actually uh, that movie. We watched that um, on Discord with a bunch of people. And, uh, that's and I, a, I imagine it made you angry. Yeah. Oh no, it made me laugh my ass off. That's a movie I watched <laughs> when I was a kid, um, and I loved it. And I still do, but for different reasons. Um, <laughs> it's crazy as all shit. Um, it's nuts, and it's it's drawn beautifully. It, it, I, I mean, yeah, it. it's it's what's his face. Um, shit, what's his name? I don't think it's Don Bluth. 
It isn't? I thought it was Donald Pluth. No, you think it is because... Um, it's probably made to match style. It's, Maybe. It is, well, it is very much. The T-Rex... Well, here's the thing. The T-Rex in We're Back looks like the T-Rex in Land Before Time. Yeah. And the mm. T-Rex in Land Before Time looks like the T-Rex from Fantasia. Because yeah. Land Before Time was originally intended as a feature-length adaptation of the Rite of Spring segment. So both the T-Rexes have the, this very characteristic boxy skull. This, like, yeah. cubicle snout to them. So that that's it kind of them, the tracing of yeah. that design. Uh, okay. But now, yeah, so you'll have uh, artificial time travel where, you know, somebody will build a time machine and go back in time and hang out with dinosaurs. Or you'll have some sort of natural phenomena that will either allow people to, to go back in time or will, will allow prehistoric animals to wander into the present, which is fun. Mm-hmm. Or you'll have random ass science where someone gets dino DNA and <laughs> makes a theme park dino many, many times over. Bingo. Dino uh. DNA. Yeah, so that's our, <laughs> that's our third avenue, which is genetic engineering, which is my personal least favorite of all the explanations <laughs> because <laughs> it allows for all the, let me, let me put it this way. Um, for the last, oh god, 15 years or so, I have had to deal with uh, Jurassic Park fans. <laughs> who cannot get over the fact that shock horror, some things in the Jurassic Park movie are wrong. <laughs> Either they were wrong when it was made, or they have subsequently been shown to be wrong through you know further research. And rather than just fucking accept that, that a movie made 24 years ago got some stuff wrong, mm -hmm. they have to invoke the genetic engineering as an excuse. <laughs> or like, oh, well, they're, they're just genetic mutants. They're not real dinosaurs. I'm like, you do realize this completely defeats the purpose of yeah. the movie. Well, it was an imagining of the time. And now, of course, we have to bring everything back because it makes money. But regardless of that, the well, even then, like the, imag the imagining thrown up in a Hollywood movie is, is going to, if it's going to have flaws, the director's going to say, eh, I want to do this. It looks cool. And they're going to do what they want. Yeah, it, it, that so, always felt like a plot that was very, how do we get dinosaurs into the modern era? Uh, genetic engineering, put it in a lab, and throw some techno babble on top of it. Perfect. That's all I need. That, Don't look into it any further. Well, that's put just, Samuel Jackson and Jeff Glo Goldblum in the movie, you're good. Yeah. Well, Spend more money in the animatronics than anything else. Well, this is why Jurassic Park gets away with it, is because... Um, they don't spend a whole lot of time on it. It's just a quick scene right. with a film that is, in, you know, in universe designed to, you know, be understood by five year olds. And, yeah. the, and the reason you believe it is because the dinosaurs themselves are so real. That's what allows you to, um, either forgive or ignore the bullshit and just allow yourself to be immersed in the movie. Steven Spielberg, when he read the script, knew that um, this whole idea of dinosaurs being you know, genetically engineered and coexisting with human beings in 1993, if he was going to make that work, um, it was absolutely essential that the dinosaurs feel as real as possible. I mean, if you watch the, you know, any making of thing of Jurassic Park, they go on and on and on and on about how you know, they did their best mm -hmm. to make the dinosaurs as you know, accurate as possible. Yeah. And what but I still, it's an imagining. <laughs> That's the important part to take away here. Yeah, it's it's an imagining of an imagining. So it's just degrees of separation. But see, here's the thing. In Jurassic during the production of Jurassic Park, there was a time when if somebody did something, if like an artist did something, a scientist could point to it and say, This is stupid, this has to go. <laughs> um and the best example of that is uh the Raptors in the Kitchen scene. Um, so Jurassic Park, actually, interestingly, instead of doing just traditional storyboards, they also um, did a lot of stop-motion animation for, to work out how the scenes were going to work. Okay. And in one of the uh, early tests of the raptors in the kitchen scene, the raptors were given a uh, like a, a Komodo dragon-like tongue that they would you know flick out <laughs> like a lizard <laughs> um, to like kind of you know sn sniff out their prey. And mm -hmm. um, Jack Horner, who was the scientist working with them at the time, Led to that and goes, you know, whose stupid idea was that? That's <laughs> completely, you know, <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing is but, um, the whole thing is that they're like birds, they're not like lizards. You get rid of that. I that I don't know if that's if anyone still listens to their um, their set 
um, experts anymore. Oh, they're consultants. They're, they're consultants anymore, though. I, 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 I do think that that yeah, is a very that's really dwindling cool. um, occupation for Hollywood. I remember we went, we were at a Comic Con and we went to a panel all about being consultants for either a sci-fi show or a historical piece or something. And the base, the, 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 there was a panelist there who was a consultant. He said, yeah, well, back in the day, you had a lot of input. Nowadays, it's, hey, how can I justify insert ridiculous premise? And you'll give them the basics of physics or something, and they'll go, okay, that's enough. And they'll just throw in some buzzwords without actually understanding the fundamentals. And I think that's like, well, uh, these dinosaur movies are ripe with that. Um, I, not Jurassic Park, not the first one. Um, okay. it, Interesting. It, now, with the Jurassic Park movies, it dwindles more and more with each new movie. Um, of course. To the point where we get to Jurassic World, which has, um, shat out any, uh, pretense of, <laughs> um, trying to get things right. And, but with the first movie, like, there's a lot of things. Dr. Grant will often say things and talk about, you know, the, the science, and it's not just techno battle. It's, no, I, I understand what he's talking about, and he's right. Um, now, mm-hmm. there, now there's bullshit in there, too, uh, both in uh, the, you know, the, the science of what's being talked about in the movie as well as the dinosaurs themselves. What I've often said about Jurassic Park is that um, they tried. They didn't, you know, what, how well they succeeded or if they succeeded or to what extent they succeeded, that's a matter of debate and that's a matter of you know, personal taste even, depending on who you talk to. But yeah. I would never say they didn't try. They absolutely tried. The dinosaurs of Jurassic Park are more or less an accurate reflection of what we thought dinosaurs were like in 1993. As opposed to Jurassic World, where depending on the dinosaur, depending on the animal, um, the most recent, I can say their animals look, are 1993. Some of them more 1893. <laughs> Jurassic World actually is worse than Jurassic Park in terms of its accuracy. Despite, wow. Despite the majority of dinosaur research having been conducted in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Well, to be fair, I mean, at that point, you've created a universe for Jurassic Park. I mean, like, I, I get what they're doing at Jurassic Park. They're doing whatever the fuck they want, basically. But you've created a universe where dinosaurs look a certain way. And I believe one of the big things is that has been discovered is that dinosaurs have feathers, yes? Correct. And so you've created a, an image of dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. And now we know that dinosaurs have feathers. You have two options. First of all, remake the movie, be accurate as possible, or go with an image that people recognize, a nostalgic image. An image that jives with the sort of mythical idea of dinosaurs from our childhood, because they're selling, they're marketing to us, basically. Oh, yeah. For, from a business standpoint, absolutely, you're going to bank on the more traditional, albeit scientifically incorrect, idea. However, at the same time, the latest Jurassic Park, you know, they smashed up a bunch of DNA and made an entirely new species. Well, if you're going to go that far, then you could just be accurate and just call it you know whatever and at the same time be accurate so you know who cares there is yeah so here's what i have to say about that again you're talking to somebody who was wrestling with all of these ideas (laughs) all throughout you know from when jurassic world announced to when it was eventually Mm -hmm. released um yeah but here's the thing uh, so yeah, a lot of people have said that you know they're they're try- they are catering to an expectation of what people would expect dinosaurs to look like uh, because of, of Jurassic Park's own iconography. What I would say to that is that is the exact opposite of what was done with the first movie. With mm-hmm. the first movie, um, dinosaurs were still in the popular imagination, uh, slow, cold-blooded, dim-witted, sluggish. Um, you know, dead dead ends, essentially. Um, yeah. That was still the popular image of dinosaurs. Even though the scientific image of dinosaurs had been changing for the previous 30 years, that was still what people were expecting. That was the expectation of dinosaurs that they were going into. And Jurassic Park did not cater to those expectations. Jurassic Park defied those expectations by using science as the basis of its aesthetic makeup. Jurassic World did the opposite. Jurassic World caters to expectations, the expectations created by the first movie. So Mm -hmm. in a way, 
the snake has eaten its own tail. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's what I would have done. Now, and if you want to know what I would have done, I have 145,000 words <laughs> that lay all this out. Um, I, I rewrote Jurassic World to make it the movie that I wanted it to be. Because here's the thing. I had spent years trying to come up with what I thought would be a good idea for a fourth Jurassic Park movie. I mean, that's sure. the one thing that Jurassic Park sequels have failed to do, is come up with an interesting idea, a story worth telling. Mm-hmm. Um, what I love about Jurassic World is I think it nails the premise. I think that is absolutely how you should be making a Jurassic Park movie in 2015. Because um, Jurassic Park was a movie about dinosaurs. And I know that sounds pretty stupid, little <laughs> fucking simple. It's Jurassic Park's a movie about dinosaurs. But it's not just not just in the sense that it's a story about dinosaurs, but it's about dinosaurs. It's about yeah. our relationship with dinosaurs, what they are to us. And if you're going to make a Jurassic Park movie, you know, 20 years later, it also has to be about dinosaurs, but it has to be about what dinosaurs are now, thanks to Jurassic Park. Yeah. And their whole thing of, we've been running this park for 10 years, um, audiences have started to get bored with our real dinosaurs, so now we should make fake dinosaurs that cater to their expectations. <laughs> and I think that is an absolutely great idea. The irony. <laughs> yes. Um, the self-awareness is yeah, palpable. exactly. The problem is it missed the mark on the self-awareness by not making the dinosaurs accurate, by not making the non-mutant dinosaurs accurate. Uh, because here's the thing. Is if, you know, I, if I look at, you know, one of the raptors in the movie and I say, okay, this animal is three times the size of the real thing, has totally different body proportions, and of course, it should be covered in feathers from head to tail, and mm-hmm. the fans will just send me, well, don't you know the Jurassic Park animals are genetic mutants? They're made for, I'm like, <laughs> okay, but that means that they're every bit as much genetic mutants as the hybrid that they created. So yeah. what's the difference between them? you know, in terms of the story. So And now that you mention it, like it's so it would be so easy to do that too, because the your premise you're already working off of with each of these movies is science has done something terrible. Science has, you know, overreached its uh ethical limits <clears throat> and now it's wreaking havoc. So just bury the actual factual dinosaurs in the science. And who cares what they come out as, as long as, you know, your final product is wowing um your audience and you can totally do that with dinosaurs with feathers just make them scary that's not hard yeah it's uh, and one well one uh, here's one thing that you know a lot of fans were saying is that they you know and this was this is the only honest argument i'll ever accept from fans of jurassic park is i don't want to see feathered dinosaurs because i like the old designs i'm like okay fine that's up that's honest at least Mm -hmm. Um, But to me, the great thing about Jurassic Park is you don't have to choose. You can have both. And in fact, this this was an idea that was actually floating around um, Jurassic Park fan circles when the first Jurassic World trailer was released. Um, Because if you notice, in the park map, there's this big section in the north that's completely cordoned off from the rest of the island. And that's labeled restricted area. Like, why is it restricted? Um, and fans were theorizing that maybe there were remnants of the old park. There are remnants of the previous generation of dinosaurs living in that northern section. Yeah. So what I did was I had all the dinosaurs made for the new park be 100% scientifically accurate while having that first generation uh, live up in the north, and when everything goes to hell, uh, there is a mixture where you actually see both at the same time. I could definitely see that happening. But then there's that aspect of the forbidden section and what's there. And yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. You could have both. I mean, they already, you know, the last movie already said, we'll just make whatever. Yeah. So shit, embrace that. Go for it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what they do with uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. <laughs> oh my God, is there already there's another one? Oh. Yeah, it's coming out in uh, June. Uh, yeah, June 2018. I didn't. Uh, we. I don't think we saw Jurassic World. I didn't. You're yeah. not. You're not missing I'm, much. I'm so yeah. done. Like this whole thing is a lot of. This is. I mean, this is unrelated to the current topic. So I mean, I don't know. It's up to you, Prascor, but I kind of want to steer away from it. 
but um, the the more we we reindulge ourselves with old franchises, the worse the, they get, regardless of dinosaur related or sci fi related. Well, and or I'm fine. Related. I'm fine with another movie being about dinosaurs brought to the modern era through yeah, why not scientific just make a new movie. Yeah, like it it's, doesn't it can be Jurassic Park, but it doesn't have to be about a theme park where bad things happen. It could be like any other press. I I just want to see dinosaurs. Uh, the problem is it's always these dumbass people in a park and they keep setting up the park and it keeps going wrong and it's like, you know people would wise up. I know that people are stupid and they continually build their houses where you know floods and hurricanes happen. But not everyone's that stupid. They would start just failing because no one wants to get eaten alive. So why the, I can't suspend my disbelief anymore. The well, dinosaurs are cool. Please give me that. But do it in some other premise. Well, here's well. I mean, I both agree and disagree with that. Um, I agree with the whole give me a new premise because God fucking damn it. Um, <laughs> but I will first of all. Here's the thing with the Jurassic Park movies. Um, they've really only tried to open a park twice. Uh, one was in the first movie. The other was in the Third and the fourth movie. Um, the second one, they try to open a park, but that fails before they even get off the ground. Um, yeah. So the first time they try to open a park, it fails. The second time they try to open a park, it works for a while. Um, the park was open for ten years, and according to supplementary material, there wasn't a single security incident in all that time. <laughs> and um, you know, it's that whole thing where where there is money to be made, people will make the same mistake again. Especially, and that's one thing I try to do uh, with the rewrite is try to show how people try to convince themselves that no, we can do it right. You know, not because they actually had good information, but because they saw the money involved and were like, oh, I mean, people might die, but you know, money. <laughs> and so on the one, but on the other hand. Yes, um, I have been a big proponent that the Jurassic Park franchise needs to die for dinosaur movies to continue. Because yeah, I'm, a, yeah. I'm an educator. You know, I know this for a fact. Jurassic Park is the meter by which people have been viewing dinosaurs for the last 24 years. Um, it's uh, like it, the the most recent uh, King Kong movie, Kong Skull Island. The director of that movie specifically said that he didn't want there to be any dinosaurs in that movie because, according to him, Jurassic World owns that. I'm like, yeah, that's the fucking problem, is that we're apparently oh, only seeing Jesus. dinosaurs in this one movie franchise. Do they? But is that is that really a problem? Do they have IP on dinosaurs? No, no, it's not. You can't own yeah, that. No, they're, they're animals, you can't. Uh, but I'm sure they own a specific look that people no, um, no, they don't. associate with dinosaurs. They don't. But how can they? they? Don't, you you no. can't copyright this, a biological speculation this is a, unless it's like... Well, yeah. the thing is, their version of it... I, I'm, I'm, sh uh, I'm. This version of a dinosaur is inaccurate. Therefore, well, the I, the hybrid, yes, they could probably copy they have, that. They have, but the idea, yeah, the idea of dinosaurs and how even the T Rex with the boxy head, um, that is like that is so widespread and is so adapted by so many things at this point, it's become generic. That I, you would be so hard pressed to say no, they own that. This is a huge, um, huge problem in professional paleo art, is copying of certain types of reconstructions. Yeah. Universal does not own the rights to Tyrannosaurus Rex, nor do they own that specific design for T-Rex, because the Jurassic Park T-Rex is very distinctive. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, at least, you know, if you're me or someone like me who is a freak. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, th there's this toy line called uh, Papo. Papo... Um, figures who make dinosaur figures and most of their dinosaur figures are copied directly from the jurassic park movies the t-rex and the wow. raptor in particular are very striking um but no you cannot claim you cannot like go into a court and say you know they stole my particular reconstruction um it's a problem and i i wish that what there was a bit more um I don't. I wish there was better practice. I wish people would devote more time to creating their own reconstruction instead of just copying what they see uh, in movies and such. But as far as legality goes, unfortunately, no. You can. You know, these are animals. Nobody owns them, um, and nobody owns a specific look to them. I could see, like, if you took a snapshot of the Jurassic Park T Rex and then, you know, traced it. 
use the same color scheme and all that, there would be a slight better chance of, yeah, I know you clearly lifted that from Jurassic Park, but as far as like, oh, we want a movie with T-Rexes in it, no one owns that, and it'd be stupid if you could. Actually, Abysme, you're, uh, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. Um, on Twitter a few weeks ago, um, Brandon posted, he went to um, a museum in Columbus that had dinosaur stuff in the gift shop, and he took a picture mm-hmm. of a backpack and with a T-Rex on it, and I'm like, that was traced directly from one of the ren- <laughs> from one of the renders from Jurassic World, one of the promotional renders. Uh, <laughs> it's that bad. It's that bad oh, in terms man. of um, copying other people's work and, and selling it. I mean, you you oh, think it's bad in uh, in creepy pasta? <laughs> it is, <laughs> but no, this is literally taking other people's artwork and putting it on shirts and backpacks and such and selling it. Well, OC, don't steal. Okay, but I mean. <laughs> Uh, there's there's something that's interesting here because let's say um, as far as scientific drawings go and uh, drawings of T Rexes and, and other types of dinosaurs, I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar. I imagine there has to be a thread of of copying and using what was done before the same way you, with math and theory and physics, because other people spent that much time to to study this and find out what a dinosaur actually looks like. And if you want your depiction to be accurate, then you might have to take from another person. Well, there's always um, more levity in using something if you're doing it for scientific or educational purposes. Yeah, so I'm saying that that there might be a culture of copying already ingrained. Yeah, but for like creative and merchandising and entertainment purposes, uh, definitely I think it extends to that, but yeah. as Prescott was saying, we need to we absolutely need to get away from the fact that if you're going to use dinosaurs in a movie, it can only be Jurassic Park. Um, yeah. This actually reminds me, uh, do you remember Red Letter Media watching Carnosaur? <sighs> uh, no. Carnosaur, well, I think there's a sequel as well. There's it's three basically sequels. Oh, there's three. Oh, God. If for anyone who doesn't know, it's essentially a low budget ripoff of Jurassic Park, um, and a very bad one at that. Of just uh, almost beat for beat on a lot of things, and it's funny because it's like you guys could have done anything with that. It's a raptor. Do whatever you want with it. But Jurassic Park, that's the successful one. It's it's very unfortunate. Yeah. That, yeah. Like I said, we need. We need more dinosaur movies. And, we do. Um, now, having said... Well, I think a problem... Uh, sorry, just to like f- finalize my thoughts. I think a problem is a lot of people, like kind of with cartoons, a lot of people assume, oh, dinosaurs, that's for that's a family movie. That's for kids. And which is unfortunate because, you know, saying something's for kids and only kids really limits the potential for creativity to do something with um, a subject and apply it to either a very small audience or to general audiences. And the fact that people think that, you know, it can only be Jurassic Park and it has to be a summer blockbuster and it has to be PG or maybe PG-13 or whatever is uh, it's very damaging because, you know, you, you locked it in this box that it's so rigid and you can't get out of it. A little bit. Now, of course, there is the issue of um, if you're going to make a dinosaur movie, chances are you're probably going to, you know, need special effects for that. And special effects mm-hmm. cost money. And where's that money going to yeah. come from? And, um, you know, there's that whole issue. Um, but just to quickly, just to quickly go back to some, to something Paprika said, which is absolutely true. Um, there is definitely a, a culture in paleo reconstructions of, of copying things that have come before. Now, on the one hand, it is absolutely impossible not to be influenced by things you've seen before. Yes. Especially if you mm-hmm. are a paleo artist and you admire the work done by those who came before you, you know. But there's a difference between um, emulating or paying homage or, you know, being honestly inspired and just mm-hmm. an outright copying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And indeed, you know, there's one particular artist I know called Mark Witten who is an app who is a huge fan of classic paleo art by people like um, uh, Charles Knight and Zudnek Burian, and he'll let those influences show uh, in the work in things like composition or lighting or color. Mm. Sure. Um, and and uh, here's the problem, though. 
is that increasingly, increasingly we are entering a period where um, people are drawing prehistoric animals, and the question is, well, what are we going to reference? Because we can't just draw them wholesale from imagination, we have to use something as a reference. Now, there are two possible things they can use as reference. One, the science. They can, you know, look at the fossils, uh, study anatomy, study, you know, the, the living animals who are the closest relatives, as well as the best ecological um, analogs, and try to come up with something, you know, based on that. Or they could just copy something that somebody else has done. Um, <laughs> so we have a culture that is referencing itself instead of referencing oh. the science. And that's where the problems come from. Does that make it sort of hard generally to, to visualize some of the things that are discovered about dinosaurs? Uh, not if you know where to look. Um, if you know which paleo artists are um, the ones who really dedicate a lot of time into research and creating these reconstructions that are, you know, very, very credible, that have a lot of evidence behind them, then yes, you can visualize those things. But um, let's say, for example, that you're just... You, let's say, for example, that you, um, you you look you're on Facebook. You look on the right. You see something's trending, and it's a new dinosaur they discovered. More often than not, the artwork you are seeing is not going to be very good because mm -hmm. it is coming from somebody who hasn't done the necessary research. And you know, on the one hand, yes, I would love it if every paleo reconstruction could be as rigorously that rigorously researched as possible, but. The fact is, but that's also difficult too. It's difficult to find the information. Not everything is open access. Um, True. Mm -hmm. It's you know, doing research takes a lot of time and also a lot of expertise. And not everybody who draws a dinosaur is going to have that. You know, there are you know, oftentimes you know, for example, when uh, a publishing house wants to put out a dinosaur book, you know, they just have their illustrator that they commission, and that person doesn't know. You know what, what to where to go to look to research. You know most of their knowledge doesn't extend beyond Jurassic Park, and I can't fault them for that. It's not their job. They're not a professional paleo artist, but it, it yeah. does extend. In, but it, but it's going to get into a book, and that book's going to get into the market, and kids are going to see it, and it's it's going to make my job as an educator all the more difficult. Yeah, I can totally see yeah. that. So, and then that happens with so many things. Anyone who's Presenting something based in science or in any academia, and they don't do or they don't know how to do the proper research. And if should that blow up and become popular, that paints a lot of perceptions. Now you hope that if a kid does see it and they do get attracted to that field, um, they still are fascinated by the actual truth of it and the process of discovery and learning. But a lot of people, they, you know, if, oh no, dinosaurs, they just had feathers. Oh, well, that's not cool. Yeah. And they just, they're turned off from it, and it's it's a shame. It's a tragic shame. Yeah. Although I will say, uh, from my experience, that type of person is actually the minority. I think you see a lot of that on the internet of people going, well, feathered dinosaurs are stupid. Um, the Pluto isn't a planet. <laughs> or Pluto is a planet. Um... <laughs> But speaking as somebody, as an educator, and seeing all these people come through the museum all the time and talking to a lot of them about feathered dinosaurs, more often than not, people are excited, both the young and the old, about the idea that dinosaurs had feathers, that birds are dinosaurs, all that great stuff. Um, and I see it. I see it in action. So, for example, in, in the gift shop, we sell these, these T-Rex figures. Now, some of them are the old, um, purely scaly versions, but we also have these newer more feathery ones. And well, yeah, paper came out a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, that maybe this model is a little bit too feathery, maybe. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> it presents a very different image, and people are not turned on by this image. Or not turned off by it, I should say. Um, they will pay, it's the most expensive model in the shop, they will, they will pay $26 for this um, feathery T-Rex over the wow. cheaper scaly ones. The interest wow. is there. It's, you know, the Jurassic Park... You just have to foster Yeah, it. the Jurassic Park fanboys are not the majority. Thank That's fucking good God. <laughs> <laughs> do, um, do any of these scientific drawings, they, do they have a journal, or do they end up in uh, pre-existing journals? Are they just on JSTOR or something? Um, oh, that's a good question. Now, a lot of these people will post on their own websites. 
Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes they will, and sometimes they do end up in journals. Sometimes if the, if the author in particular care about such things, and some authors don't. Some um, scientists could not care less about illustrations or art, which to me is fucking ridiculous. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a shame with this particular. It, you know, I'm I'm interested in this because you seem it seems like illustration is very necessary for this field. There is no um, relationship between science and art as, as intricate as that between paleontology and and paleo art. Yeah, and you know, I now fortunately all the scientists that I follow, my friends, people like um, Darren Nash, uh, will specifically try to get. Uh, well-known and good paleo artists to um, reproduct animals if they're if they're publishing a new paper that's describing a new animal. Um, Mark Witten, who I mentioned earlier, he is both a scientist and an, uh, a paleo artist. So when he's pu oh, wow. when he's publishing on something, he'll just draw it himself, and it will look fantastic. <laughs> um, so there are definitely instances, you know, where that that can work, and I'm very happy about that. Wow. Um, That's all I can say is just wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess I, I sh guess I should link to some of these paleo artists in the um, in, in yeah, definitely, definitely yeah. yeah. Their work. I think that's what this is turning into is a uh, the importance of illustration. Sure. Yeah. Well, this is about uh, dinosaurs and science fiction, and technically speaking, paleo art is in a way. Science fiction. <laughs> just one. You can argue that. Yeah. Just one that sure. we hope leans very, very, very heavily on the science part of it. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's it's speculating about um, something either in the future or the past based on science. I would absolutely say it is science fiction. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, I have, I have a few personal favorites that I can link to. Um, and hey, there are artists for sale. So if you see something you like. Feel free to support original yeah. paleo art. Um, but yes. But um, going back to something that uh, Bismi said a little earlier. Um, so the Jurassic Park franchise needs to die, and we need to have new dinosaur movies. We need to have new dinosaur stories. Well, what stories would we want to tell? What are some of the ideas? That is a very good question. Yeah. I... I've been struggling to come up with one that isn't a already been done to death. Are we talking stories in general or science fiction esque stories? In general, I think. I, would, I or, suppose you could argue that. Oh, yeah, why not? That they fall into the same category, but let's say they don't. See, yeah, theoretically, <laughs> you, you have something like Dinotage or not Dinotasia. Um, what is it called? Uh, Dinotopia. That is yeah. pure fantasy. Um, but having said that, the vast majority of dinosaur media uh, historically has been science fiction. Of some kind. Well, I think even with uh, fantasy, you still have that opportunity to present whatever you want. So you could be accurate in one way or another. You know, it's funny. I, and, I actually, um, when I was, you know, pissed off about Jurassic World and how none of its dinosaurs, you know, looked like dinosaurs, I went around and picked all of the dumbest franchises I could think of and be like, their dinosaurs are more accurate than Jurassic World's dinosaurs. <laughs> like, um, you could write a web article on yeah, that. Yeah, like, okay, let's see. Uh, Pokemon, they have feathered dinosaurs. <laughs> um, Doctor Who, they had feathered dinosaurs. Um, oh, uh, no. The Transformers movies, they had some uh, fuzzy ornithisians. <laughs> so, they, yeah, it's like, these are the franchises that are doing it better than Transformers gets a gold star. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> that is so good. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I think they, I mean, I don't know all of them, but I think maybe a good way to do it is to start out just sprinkling dinosaurs in as opposed to having them being the main features. That's a very cute idea, actually. What about, let's say, uh, you, we were talking at the beginning of this about intelligent dinosaur life, and you had said how um, it's been explored heavily, but I personally haven't. Um, consciously been aware of it being explored heavily. I would love to see like a Zootopia type movie uh, <laughs> set, you know, 60 million years ago in a supposed, you know, dinosaur civilization. That'd be super fun. But have them look like very accurate. I think yeah. that'd be awesome. I, I can't give you quite a Zootopia story, but I can actually link to you uh, an article that um, I have another thing I'll put in the description. I should make a list um, that links to the history of um, intelligent dinosaurs. Um, 
in media, a brief overview. Um, but yeah, but Absolutely. we but we could always use all this but we could always use some more. And yeah, something like something like you know even yeah something even like that like a, a you know a, a film meant for you know younger audiences as well as older ones. I could see that being a really good Pixar sort of movie. Well, it's funny you mention it. It's funny you oh, mention yeah. that because <laughs> this actually leads both to um, some fun ranting on my part as well as my idea for what I would want to do in terms of you know a dinosaur movie, which is that um, one of the most you know, true and tried ideas for um, speculative evolution is uh, an alternate timeline where the KPG mass extinction event never happened, um, and mm-hmm. non-bird dinosaurs and other uh, animals continue to evolve to you know the present day. What might they look Hell like? Oh yeah, um, that is a scenario that has been done very many times. It's one of those things that borders between classic and cliche. Um, mm-hmm. Now Pixar decided to try their hand at this idea a few years ago. With their movie, The Good Dinosaur. You're right. Oh, I remember that coming out and not seeing it because uh, the branding and the advertising for it was, I think, underfunded for once because I saw almost nothing. And because I saw almost nothing, I didn't bother to look it up. Yeah. And the just, I don't know, the logo and just like the, the, the snapshot was very uninspiring. So it, it like, was. It's just, uninspired is probably it the is. best word I can think of to describe this movie. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, it's a world where weirdly cartoony dinosaurs are living in an extremely beautiful, breathtaking, photorealistic landscape. Um, mm. the, the juxtaposition is extremely jarring and does not work. But ultimately, it's the story of uh, a young Apatosaurus who adopts a human boy as his dog. And it's a boy and his dog story. And I'm like, <laughs> you start out with this great premise of an alternate world where, you know, that mass extinction never happened and we still have dinosaurs and other animals. And this is the story you go with it? This is the direction you take it? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they did, because here's the thing. My, um, of all of the, um, interpretations of this scenario that have been done, my personal favorite was a, a largely discontinued online project called the Speculative Dinosaur Project, which, I mean, it, it, it did. It tried to uh, trace the evolution of all these different animals from the late Cretaceous of 66 million years ago to the present, minus that extinction event. And some of the creatures they came up with were absolutely astonishing, while also being very, very heavily grounded in uh, science and uh, reality. So, for example, um, today, the oceans of the southern hemisphere are largely dominated by a combination of toothed whales and seals and sea lions. Now, mm-hmm. in this particular timeline, those groups never evolved, of course. So, what creatures rule the southern oceans? Well, they are largely dominated by a combination of fully marine uh, descendants of platypuses and uh, large predatory penguins, and the reason for this okay. the reason for this is that both of those groups had members that were alive during the late Cretaceous, unlike whales and seals. So you might conceivably have um, you you would you know it's entirely possible those groups would survive to the present, and the reason that they are occupying the large predator niches is because nothing else can really do it. Um, the only other large marine predators are sharks and mosasaurs, both of which mm. are, uh, were, or were, at least I should say, in their particular visualization, uh, ectothermic, cold-blooded. So you're not going to be getting mm. them in the, in the far south. So that's an open ecology that uh, birds and mammals can more easily exploit. So that's why those groups evolve. So you'll have these wow. beautiful paintings of these absolutely bizarre, like, they almost look like, you know, beaked whales and, you know, with these crazy features that harbor electrosensors and, and also these, you know, terrifying predatory penguins that are like... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. Predatory <laughs> penguins is something Lovecraft well, would pre- imagine. Well, penguins are predatory, but... Well, we'll put, like, large ones that are, like, much more aggressive and yeah. is carnivorous looking. Macro, like that is, yeah. Macro-predatory yeah. penguins. That is was, such uh, a at the mountains of madness thing. 
He probably would have put that in if he had thought of it. There was a doctor documentary. Um, I remember when I was in high school watching it, I think on the Discovery Channel or something. I really enjoyed it. was super excited when I when you know it came out and I could watch it. Uh, it was, I, I just looked it up. I think it's called Alien Planet. Ah, yes. And it's, a whole, <laughs> it's a whole imagining of just what alien life might look like on other planets well, because it's very hard to visualize that. It is. And here's what I'm going to say about that. Um, Alien Planet is a very interesting documentary because it, it, the point is to imagine um, – it's more about imagining the actual expedition to an alien planet. Um, that's where most of thought went. And when it came time to actually create their aliens, they realized, well, we're not imaginative enough to do this. So mm-hmm. instead, they went to Wayne Barlow, one of the greatest science fiction artists alive. And his book, Expedition, being an account in words and of art, the uh, 2357, I think it is, Voyage to Darwin Four. So Alien Planet is actually, in some ways, an adaptation of Barlow's book, oh, okay. uh, which is unfortunately out of print, um, but has, I am very fortunate enough to have a copy, it has breathtaking uh, paintings of this alien landscape, and you, anybody can, can Google this, uh, Alien Planet or Wayne Barlow Expedition, and you will see um, the absolutely beautiful and strange beautiful creatures. Creatures, yeah. Low density planets, uh, low gravity planets, like uh, the the idea for the for the uh, for the planet itself drove the um, yeah. the creation of the the animal, which um, led for some very imaginative, beautiful things. Yep. So, like, and some of those images are still imprinted in my head now. And it's and it's and here's the thing: uh, the, the the documentary is great, but the book is. Infin- Way infinitely better. more beautiful, yes, because okay. uh, the the documentary takes a more utilitarian view. Yeah. which I mean, you know, we would expect, of course, but um, Barlow really gets lost in the beauty of it all. And um, yeah, this, like I said, lo- and a lot of the things were actually changed for the documentary. So, for example, the Emperor Sea Strider um, mm-hmm. was that was shrunk uh, from its original size. Uh, the original Sea Strider. Oh, let's see if I can remember this. I think about 700 meters tall. Um, really? Yeah. And um, that's a. I think that's the specific uh, prompt for that one is how big could we make a creature? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and have it support itself. Yeah, no, and they really do a great job because, like we said, uh, high density, low gravity, so um, it's going to be a lot easier for creatures like that to support their weight. Mm-hmm. Um, that's also why Darwin 4 allows for the evolution of. Um, uh, like com- these creatures that fly by a comb- internal combustion of gases and um, uh, oh wow levitation uh, like sacks. They're they're mm-hmm. they're sapient. Yeah. They're sapient species. Actually, are these space whales? <laughs> uh, well, there are space whales, and that's another creature that was actually cut from the documentary. Yeah. Was the uh, e- oh really the ebony blister wing, which has a wingspan of over a thousand feet. Lame. That would have been awesome yeah, to see. Really. Uh, but no. I would highly encourage anybody to uh, uh, check this out. But yeah, so this. But anyway, this, this as a movie, just that documentary alone holds up. I'm, I imagine a dinosaur movie in the same vein would as well. So like, so Maybe, like, yeah. an intru- so like a sort of um, speculative um, faux documentary about the journey to an alternate world where dinosaurs never died out, and to see you know all the strange creatures that you know evolved. Uh, in in their or place. hell, even an episode of Rick and Morty. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I, I think you know, and you uh, you could do a faux documentary, but I think just even a no, not a faux doc. Like the documentary would be adapted to a movie. That's oh oh yeah about. yeah no definitely. But even just a movie where you go to a different planet and you can even reference it in the movie. Some scientist says like, oh well, we've had all these theories about speculating how dinosaurs would have evolved and th- these are the perfect conditions and you can premise it that way and then just go crazy. Mm. That would be fantastic mm-hmm. to watch. Yeah, it's... Like I said, there have been a lot of interpretations of this scenario, some more likely than others. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to um, to imagine but also to, to ground things in, in science and, and what we know. 
Right. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, going back to something like Jurassic Park, it's actually, it's supposed to be very imaginative, but it's actually quite limited. When you get into the science behind something like dinosaurs, you open yourself up to a world of possibilities that are actually possible. Therefore, in my opinion, they're far more interesting and imaginative. You are. They take your brain to new places. You are getting into uh, something that we in the paleo community <laughs> refer to as uh, the All Yesterdays Movement. Which is basically this idea that our knowledge of prehistoric animals is extremely limited. What we know um, is very little. So when we reconstruct prehistoric animals in art and film and you know video games and such, we have to rely on speculation to some degree. And Jurassic Park is very, very conservative in that respect. Mm -hmm. The animals are all very, very dull in terms of like their colors. Um, their anatomy, like so it's, they're recognizable on purpose. Yeah. As well, well, think think of it. Think of it. Some bleh, bleh, bleh. Think of something like this: um, the tail of a peacock. There is no osteological correlate. There is nothing in the skeleton of, of a peacock that would tell you that it had something like that tail. Mm. So just imagine what sort of incredible anatomies and behaviors we might be missing out from prehistoric animals simply because they do not leave a trace, and they are, again, something that we just cannot know. So artists have started to embrace this speculative aspect and have started to imagine the possibility of prehistoric animals with incredible, crazy soft tissue displays um, or interesting, unusual behaviors that we see from animals today. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, sometimes predator, sometimes uh, herbivorous animals will eat meat. You yeah. know, sometimes because it's something that's lacking in their diet, like deer, for example, will eat the bones of other animals because they need the extra calcium for their antlers. You know, things like that. So, portraying prehistoric animals in these unusual ways, not necessarily saying that they did look like this or did behave like this, but simply uh, bringing it up as you know, one possibility among many. So when, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know for sure, but our current paleo artists embracing the idea of dinosaurs having very, very colorful and vibrant plumage, Ye as we know a lot of birds these days do. Yes, uh, some arguably a little bit too much. Um, <laughs> there, is, there is a phenomenon uh, that some have called sparkle raptors, which is when... Um, <laughs> Now, okay, My Little Pony has sparkle raptors. That's going to be the new movie. Well, they're just going to have raptors. Oh, that would be like a great Lisa Frank thing. Oh, my oh I would love to see raptors. that. Sparkle raptors. That is the best thing I've heard all week. But it's, <laughs> it's when the, they're given you know, these really, really over-the-top, gaudy color schemes that, yeah, sometimes we see them in nature, but not very much. Um, so it's like, it's not, and here's the thing. Oftentimes, you know, We've actually been able to do this a little bit. We've been able to say, you know, even if we don't necessarily know what colors an animal was, we can say which colors are more likely based on things like lifestyle and diet. So, for example, the birds that are the most colorful today are things like parrots and birds of paradise and turricos. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do these birds have in common? Well, they are fruit and insect eaters. So uh, fruits and insects contain, you know, pigments like carotenoids that can generate those mm -hmm. really, really bright colors. Um, and also, they're not really interested in camouflage. They live up high in the trees, where they're safe from most predators. Uh, they're more interested in mating. Yeah, they're yeah. more interested in sex. Um, so that's where that comes from. So it's very unlikely that, say, a T-Rex or a Velociraptor would have a color scheme like that. Uh, one, because they're not getting from uh, their diet. Two, because they don't want to be bright and colorful. They want to be able to ambush their prey. They want to blend in. So right. um, now, having said that, there are ways around this. So, for example, there is a bird today, um, the yellow-faced vulture, which has a very, very brightly colored yellow face. Now, there's yeah, I know, <laughs> shocker. Um, now, there is no, um, there are no carotenoids in meat. So, how does it have that bright yellow face? Well, wow, that that was a very interesting Jera symptom right there. <laughs> um, uh, what they do is they actually eat the feces of herbivorous animals. Holy mm. shit. Yep, and it, okay. Yes, quite literally. Um, 
And as far as we know, this is the only so that they can get the, the uh, chemicals necessary to create those bright colors. There's no other benefit to this behavior. Also, uh, what uh, flamingos eat fish and turn pink? Uh, yep, the, the shrimp that they eat. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's another thing. So, for example, there is a pterosaur called Pterodostro, which is from South America, and in its bill it has thousands and thousands of bristle-like teeth. So it has been hypothesized that, like a flamingo, it was a filter feeder of uh, small invertebrates. And it has been hypothesized that, like a flamingo, it might have been uh, brightly uh, colored pink. Now, we don't know this is for sure because pterosaur pycnofibers and bird feathers, we don't know how those are structurally similar. You'd also have to study their, the food that they ate as well. Yeah. Those nests might, might have different sorts of uh, color, colorations to them. Right. So, it, you know, it's one hypothesis, but, you know, it's not set in stone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, other than, but, yeah, having said that, there are some artists who, who do go a little overboard with the colors. There's one artist in particular called Louis Ray who is well known for his amazing Technicolor uh, dinosaurs. And um, not that they, and again, not that they're inaccurate. We, you know, there's nothing I can point to and say, oh, this is wrong. You know, just yeah. personally, I would say, oh, I might have drawn things a little differently. It's just unlikely given what we know about animals today. Yeah. yeah. Like, even though birds can see in color and probably see more colors than we do, um, and a lot of them are very bright and flashy, most of them aren't. You know, for every bright yellow canary, mm-hmm. there's three brown and white sparrows. You know, so sure. It's you know, it's one thing to portray one animal with crazy colors, but if your entire portfolio, you know, is <laughs> is nothing but you know amazing Technicolor wildlife, then yeah, yeah that's a bending suspension of disbelief for me. Sure, but on the one hand. Sparkle Raptor is going to sell a lot more than anything else. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh, I just want to see a horror movie about dinosaurs on the moon now. Yes, why or not even, both? You know, why fos- not? <laughs> uh, the government conspiracy movie about them hiding dinosaur fossils on the moon. Uh, that's the fake we documentary can't, I want to make. Because they can't be better than Marika or something. I'm going to make a fake documentary about dinosaur bones on the moon. We can, it's gonna it, can be premi- beautiful. it can premiere right after the Discovery Channel's next mermaid documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody else have any uh, ideas for dinosaur stories? Ideas you'd like to see that- in stories with dinosaurs? Um, that's all I've got, but mm. in the comments below, people just go crazy. Give us your ideas for speculative dinosaur fiction. What about a movie from the perspective of aliens visiting first for the Earth for the first time, and they're like tourists or something, and they say, ooh, what's that? Ooh, what's that? Um, um that, um, that does remind me of a, um, of a comic book series called, uh, oh, get this, Aliens vs. Dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> How about we just not do monster movies ever anymore? Mm, you can do them, just gotta be careful. <sighs> I mean, I, I don't know about you, I thought it was kind of cool. What if what if dinosaurs came from Mars? That's that I mean, was, hey, there you go. That was an idea that was floating around the internet a few years ago. <laughs> like one of those bullshit ideas that some idiot gets in their head uh-huh. and decides to go <laughs> forth with. Uh, yeah. So there was a KPG extinction event on Mars, and then they came came over here, and then it happened again because dinosaurs are apparently very stupid. They're very yeah, they are, <laughs> can't catch a break. They're very unlucky. <laughs> God, not again! <laughs> Another meteor! <laughs> <laughs> Another meteor at this time of day in this part of the country, localized entirely <laughs> within your kitchen. I told you we shouldn't should have, have been another cell system over. We shouldn't have rebuilt our house right here in this exact same spot. <laughs> Tins you get meteor insurance. <laughs> oh, what, was, what was that joke? We have meteor insurance, but not asteroid insurance or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a meteor when it's in space, but when it comes when it comes to Earth, it's an yeah, asteroid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Legally, they can get you for that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. Um, how about a movie where uh, dinosaurs survived, but they still didn't become dominant? And so we end up with, like... So we just have tiny little T-Rexes running around? We could have dinosaur pets. Well, here's the thing. That would be very boring. Well, yeah, no, I know. We sort of got that already, but... <laughs> we, we have got that already. Um, like, the, the genetic diversity, though, could have been 
added. We kind of take everything cool and then make little pocket little versions, shit of versions of it. I'm not talking Pokemon. I'm Pomeranian talking Pomeranian yeah. tiny cats, tiny dogs that we made from wolves yeah. and all that shit. Yeah, no. Yeah, somebody posted. Something. Somebody posted this thing on Facebook that was like, "The lion may be the king of the beasts, but the wolf doesn't perform in the circus." I'm like, "What the fuck do you think poodles are?" <laughs> and, um, oh. but here's the thing. But going back to Paprika's question, um, what if dinosaurs survived but didn't, but were not dominant? Um, that idea has actually popped up in other speculative evolutionary scenarios. Uh, one that was started by my good friend Darren Nash was called the Squamazoic, which basically is an alternate timeline where the KP mass extinct, KPG mass extinct event happens, but instead of it being mammals that take over and becoming dominant, it's squamates, so lizards and snakes okay. and amphibians. Mm. So lizard people. Uh, well, they didn't. They, there are no intelligent beings <laughs> in this world. Um, but the sequel would be lizard people, because we gotta have more lizard. Sure, people. why not? You know, you know what? Um, <laughs> you know what? Lizard seems most predisposed to me to evolving intelligence. Well, there's two. Uh, there's, actually, there's three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, there's. 50. Actually, actually, there's many, and they're outside my. Actually, door. all seven thousand species of lizard. They all have me cornered uh, right now. <laughs> and uh, and now I'm dead. Um, but it's uh, <laughs> it's creepy pasta. <laughs> it's um. They are tegus, monitor lizards, and chameleons. Mm. Uh, tegus and and monitors because they're very very smart for lizards. And chameleons because they have, um, they are the only lizards that have, like, a digit arrangement that lends itself to manipulating their outside world. Oh, interesting. So they have, like, I didn't know that. yeah, if you ever look at a chameleon's hand, it's really weird. Um, mm. Oh, yeah, no, the way they're shaped, yeah. So that's made so that they can grab tree branches in a certain way. Right, and that's the exact same reasons that primates evolved thumbs, was for grasping off mm -hmm. trees so they don't fall down and die. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we are going to go with intelligent lizard people, um, my vote is for chameleons. So, not only will they become intelligent and be able to manipulate their environment with their weird hands, they can also adaptively camouflage. No, that, that's great. Yep, they can camouflage, die. and they can, you know, shoot was... their tongues out at people. <sighs> Wonderful. There was a um, there was a do um. Remember that show? I forget the name of it. There was a sort of a sitcom style dinosaur show. Dinosaurs. It was that. It's just called dinosaurs. It's just called dinosaurs. Have, it's basically the Flintstones, but dinosaurs. Don't, don't have a Stegosaurus, man. Go back. It, you actually watch it. It's it's really fun. Um, I remember one episode where the son they were doing a teenage werewolf thing. So you have this anthropomorphic dinosaur lizard. That's turning into a werewolf. <laughs> and at that point, I had no idea what I was watching anymore. I, I, There's so many conflicting images. When I was a kid, I saw an episode where they all get addicted to uh, a drug. That wasn't <laughs> a plant. It was a happy plant, they called it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So that's, I mean, that's how, about, how about one where um, dinosaurs and humans have to coexist like, and go to school together? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, furry fanfics out there that have beaten down. Well, yeah, but I think that Prosecor is looking for Hollywood Sca movies. Scalies and Feathers. Yeah. All of these sort of exist already, but as far as big budget stories to tell, uh, if you want there's, some, no, there's no limit. If you want some big budget hentai, go for it. I'm not saying don't pursue your dreams. Hen but hentai? that's what they would turn into. Don't, hentai. Don't, oh, you're not going to make us explain hentai, are you? No, no but like, not on this podcast. That's where his brain takes this. But that's where most of the internet takes it. The things I'm referencing are not PG. They're not. Which is fine. I'm not judging. I am. <laughs> Partially. Hell, what if we had, instead of pegasi, unicorns, and horses, we had Neanderthals, humans, and and some smart T uh, dinosaur. For the hentai? <laughs> no. For, for My Little Pony, you mean? Yeah. Uh, no. Well, yeah, but not. <laughs> oh my god! Wait, wait, wait. So Neanderthal, <laughs> Homo sapien, and I don't know, Homo erectus, or 
Homo- uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> my, would- my little hominid. <laughs> my little hominid. <laughs> be the most, like, disturbing and ugly kid show ever. I would watch that. That'd be great. God. <laughs> Everybody's naked and they're but so hairy. That's essentially hairy. what they are because, like, you, uh, uh, unicorns can essentially just magic away anything that the Earth ponies and the Pegasus can do anyway. Yeah. So it, it's a weird class society that show has, but they just don't talk about it. <laughs> oh, Earth ponies are right? better at farming. Well, yeah, yeah, but you could magic a they farming also don't machine. don't talk about the matriarchy that happens in that show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it man. just kind of is. I love it. No, I love it. Well, I love what it used to be. You know way too much about this. I do. <laughs> I do. Uh, okay, well. That's all I've got. Yeah. I mean, I could sit here for another hour and come up with weird what ifs, um, if that's what you'd like. But type them up and then put them in the comment section. Okay. <laughs> that's your. That's your assignment. That's your homework. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess this uh, concludes this segment of the Raptor's Nest. I'd like to thank Abysme and Paprika for um, venturing all the way from wherever in time and space they happen to be to join me for this. We don't even know. To talk about uh, 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 dirty earth animal uh, analogs to My Little Pony. Yes. Is, is that what you have yes. on your planet? We, we started with it, and then we ended with <laughs> My Little Hominid. So I would yeah. say this has been a very productive session. My Little Hominid, by the way, infinitely more terrifying than uh, it. Oh, yeah. It would be, <laughs> right? be disturbing as fuck. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> well, um, uh, why don't you tell the nice um, people at home where they can find you guys? Also, thank you for having us on. Probably. Yes, uh, thank you very much oh, for having okay. us on. This was very fun. You oh. can find us, generally speaking, out among the stars. Just to well, find now that our ship is fixed, just look up that, and uh, that'd be just nice. look up and squint. You'll see them. Yeah, <laughs> probably somewhere. Preferably during the night. <laughs> uh, you can find our podcasts and live streams on YouTube, on VidMe, on iTunes, and at BenviewNetwork.com if you want to download the episode. All right, and that is some great uh, literary analysis. I actually binge watched or binge listened rather, to a bunch <laughs> of Ray Gun readers uh, episodes uh, last week. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. It's always fun to listen to. So again, thank, thank you, you for joining me tonight. With some great, some great ideas floating out there, and uh, and some bad ones, and some bad ones. <laughs> um, but that's okay because we always. You need the bad ones to learn from yes. the good ones. It's very yes. important. All right. So I think that just about settles it. Excellent.